Welcome to our second presentation on Chapter 2. We'll be starting on slide 36, which is client interviews, but let's just go back to the first slide for a second. This uh, chapter <clears throat> is about informal fact gathering and investigation. We have already talked about Rule 11, and which is one of the big reasons why we engage in informal fact finding uh, before we actually file the lawsuit for the plaintiff. And then we've talked about planning the investigation. Specifically, we looked at, here we go. The uh, six tasks that we want to accomplish before we, um, before we actually file our lawsuit. We talked about figuring out what the elements of the claim are, um, establishing a litigation chart format from which to work, uh, thinking about the source of the facts that we will use in order to find the facts, and thinking about how we go about finding them, considering, first of all, breaking them into informal discovery and formal discovery. And then within those two categories, becoming more granular and deciding, okay, we know it's going to be informal discovery, but which particular source of informal discovery? Or we know it's going to be formal discovery, which particular source of informal discovery? And finally, we go out and start doing the informal discovery, the investigation. So that leads nicely into where we are, which is the client interview. This is going to be one of the primary ways we gather that informal investigative material prior to filing the lawsuit. Again, this, this applies to both plaintiffs and defendants. Uh, much of what I'll be saying will be plaintiff-focused, but many times the defendant is aware that he or she is going to be sued, and so these same steps can absolutely happen before they, the, 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 the defendant is served with a lawsuit. <clears throat> and even if the defendant doesn't know and doesn't, doesn't first find out about the lawsuit until after the lawsuit is filed, that doesn't mean that these steps still won't happen. They just may happen um, in an expedited time frame. So let's get started talking about client interviews. And of course, these are going to be interviews between you, the paralegal, and the client. So what are your goals when you're going into the client interview? Well, likely you'll have two, especially for the first meeting. Uh, one thing that's important is to establish a rapport with the client. Very likely the client is um, intimidated, maybe a little bit afraid, um, uncertain, confused, uh, doesn't know what to expect. And people respond differently to those feelings. Um, some people become very chatty when, when they're nervous. Other people clam up. Um, other people will say whatever they think the uh, person wants them to say, whether it's the truth or not. They may not even consciously be lying. They are just so focused on making that other person, that person in authority to them, be happy that they uh, may say things that really aren't 100% true. And so putting the client at ease is going to make your job a lot easier. And it's also good client relations. Um, we want to have a good relationship with our client when that's possible. And usually at the beginning of the relationship, that's when things are best. And you can set a tone uh, that hopefully will carry longer into the case, perhaps to the conclusion of the case. S establishing a good rapport is going to likely make that client more forthcoming and more honest with you. Uh, another aspect, though, to establishing rapport is, is also to start thinking about boundaries with the client. Um, if you are, uh, for, for example, um, if everything the client says you don't challenge, and of course we're going to challenge in a nice way, but if, if during the first couple of meetings everything the client says you just accept at face value, then the client may feel kind of emboldened to exaggerate or, or, or be surprised or um, uh, taken aback if you start challenging later on when it's necessary. So it's best to start as you plan to go on. Uh, being a, a, a good host or hostess, uh, being gracious, but also uh, uh, demonstrating that you want to get the information as accurately and as clearly as possible. So the rapport is huge, in, particularly in that first meeting, but even in subsequent meetings it can be important. But you're not there just to establish rapport, obviously. You're there to get information. 
Um, so let's talk about the steps that we're going to take to advance this. Of course, the first one, the, 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 the most important, I guess, uh, starting point is going to be establishing that meeting. And of course, when you're establishing that meeting or scheduling the meeting, you are working towards that rapport and you're also working towards success at getting that information. Very likely, uh, your first communication may be a face-to-face -face if the client is meeting with the attorney at first, or it could be over the phone. It's even possible that you might write a letter to the client about your need to meet with him or her. Um, obviously, however you meet the person, you're going to want to introduce yourself to the person, and you're going to want to explain that you are the paralegal. Many times, the term paralegal may have little or no meaning to the uh, uh, client um, or, and even if it does have a meaning it may have the wrong meaning so it can be helpful especially if the attorney has not already done so to explain what your role is going to be in the case um, and that will be something that the attorney can help you know, kind of know what how he or she is going to um, apply you to that particular matter so uh, for example in some cases the paralegal is the primary contact with the client and so that would be a good way of, of talking to the client. I'm not an attorney, I'm not licensed to practice law, but I'll be the primary source of, of information both uh, from the law firm to you and from you to the law firm. That could be a good way of presenting that information. Other law firms, um, the, the, you may not be the primary uh, conduit of information, um, and so it would be helpful to explain not only what a paralegal is, but also what your particular role is in this particular matter. Um, and of course, that doesn't have to be during the first communication. Um, you ought to explain your paralegal during that first communication, but you might wait to kind of go over the nuts and bolts of, of your relationship until you have that first face-to-face -face meeting. Um, when you schedule that first meeting, you ought to already have a pretty good idea about what you hope to accomplish in the meeting, and so it's useful uh, to prepare the client so that he or she can be thinking about what the topics are going to be. Having that knowledge can help that client set up good expectations, can help him or her budget time appropriately, and can help him or her prepare. It may also help him or her deal with the butterflies and other issues. Oh, I'm going to see the attorney, but I don't know what to expect. Well, if they have some idea what to expect, that may be enough to assuage some of those nerves. Um, sometimes it's helpful to have the client take some notes beforehand. That way the client may be less likely to forget everything that, that needs to be said. They can think through it in an orderly way and that can sometimes help the meeting go quicker and be more complete and sometimes make it less necessary for subsequent meetings. So that's the argument in favor of that. But there are important legal arguments that would tend to uh, point to that not being the best path. Um, I guess two immediately occurred to me. One is that the client's notes might, under certain circumstances, be discoverable. And that's, of course, something that the attorney will be in the best position to evaluate. And so the last thing you want to do is have um, these notes that the uh, client prepared completely on his own, so no attorney or, or paralegal has looked at them, and might include damaging admissions or other um, awkward information. We'd hate for that information to land in opposing counsel's hands. Um, so that's one reason we don't want to do it, but there's other reasons too. Of course, one of the things that you're doing as you're interviewing, as you're meeting with a client, is you're evaluating the client as a witness. Um, you want the client's thoughts, but if the client comes with a checklist of comments, you aren't going to be 100% sure who prepared those. Plus, when the client is in the witness box, he or she isn't going to have access to notes. So you're not getting kind of the unfiltered version of the client. You're getting maybe what the client's spouse thinks ought to be said or something along those lines. Okay, so if you scheduled the meeting most likely by telephone, perhaps by email, you're going to want to send some kind of confirming uh, document. It might be a letter, it might be an email. And this is a reminder for the client so that he knows in a written form that he can refer to or she can refer to when the meeting is, where it'll be, how long it'll last, what to bring. Um, and that way, the, the client is, has, uh, doesn't have to keep all that information in memory. It can be kind of a tickler. It's also a good practice to um, include any helpful hints about where to park if it's not obvious where to park, or to say things like parking's validated if that's appropriate, or um, some characteristics of the building if the client hasn't been there before. You know, it's the building with the big four in front or something like that. 
Um, some things along those lines can um, help the client end up at the right place at the right time, might also help the client kind of again navigate some of those butterflies. And of course, if the client has this information, he's more likely to be on time, which, which means that you're gonna be more productive. Um, that first meeting, can be a lengthy one. I guess every uh, person kind of runs the meeting in different ways. It doesn't have to be a lengthy one. And you'll want to consider what's appropriate in the circumstances. Obviously, if you have a client who is recovering from a car accident, um, who has pain and may need to move around and things like that, uh, a several hour meeting isn't going to make sense. Or perhaps the client is quite young, a teenager, or perhaps is elderly. Um, a lengthy meeting may be too tiring for the client. Um, if the subject matter of the interview is going to be very disturbing for the client, that may be another reason that you don't want to have a lengthy meeting. Um, and of course, you may play it by ear. You might plan initially for two or three hour long meeting, but um, as you realize that the client is tiring or getting upset, um, you may decide this time isn't as productive. And so you might say, let's adjourn. Let's schedule it another time that we can meet together. Um, but it's probably a good idea to at least keep some time open because um, you may initially schedule or think it's going to be out an hour-long meeting. But once you get into it, boy, you're making great progress. The client seems to be really receptive to continuing. And so it may make sense to continue um, beyond maybe that initial hour. So it's probably good to free up the time, but keep your options open depending upon how the meeting is going. You're going to want to have a private place that again is going to make the client feel more comfortable, more forthcoming. It might be your office if you have an office with a door that you can close um, and your office is uh, of a reasonable size and a reasonable presentability. It's not stacked with papers every, every which way. A conference room is also a good choice. Um, uh, I recommend using a place like that versus, say, a Starbucks or a place like that that's a more public location because you're going to be discussing a privileged communication, so you want to have a lot of privacy when you're having those types of communications. So how are you going to prepare? Well, we've already talked about some of the preparation that you're going to do as part of your pre-suit investigation. For example, you're going to want to research the law in the area, at least to some degree. Now, many times this won't be something you'll have to spend a lot of time on. If your law firm handles basically car accident cases and this is another car accident case, well, you probably already know the law pretty well in that, in that circumstance. Um, if this is a new area or your law firm uh, it has a diverse practice, you may want to refresh yourself a little bit on the particular issues. If it really is a new area for you, um, it may not make sense for you to do a deep dive at this point. You may just want to talk to the attorney. Maybe the attorney can refer you to something that you can do a quick uh, review or a quick uh, look into so that you'll be uh, at least having some initial ideas, maybe knowing the elements of the claim. We already talked about the possibility of using uh, jury charges to help you structure um, how, what facts you're going to need to look for and how to organize the, those categories. Sometimes, in addition to the law, you're also going to want to have some knowledge about the facts. Uh, this might be especially appropriate if your client was injured. And let's say that they have a herniated disc in their back. Well, you may not be familiar with what is involved in that and what the symptoms and the treatment and uh, what the challenges might be with that particular condition. So it might be helpful for you to have a little bit more information, both so that you can ask more intelligent questions to the client and also so that the client knows that he's speaking to somebody who um, has invested time in hearing about his circumstances. And again, that's part of building rapport with the client. So the client knows that he's just not another number. You are concerned about providing him excellent services, so you know something about his circumstances even before he talks to you about them. Boy, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have a checklist of some type to make sure you don't miss a topic. This is useful even if you're going to have multiple uh, interviews with the client because, in fact, it might even be more important if you have multiple interviews because you won't have as good a recollection of what you've covered and what you haven't. There's lots of these available, um, some, for example, through Dorsanios or through some other resource. Your law firm may actually have checklists, especially if it focuses on a particular practice. It very likely will have um, a checklist of things that you want to use. This is such a handy tool. There's a lot of research out there that indicates that this is 
um, a, a very effective way of making sure you don't forget something. It's actually what surgeons and uh, air, airplane pilots do when you're working on really serious matter and it's important whether you checked to make sure that function is working or you've counted all of your sponges or whatever the thing is, it can make sure that, that you're not forgetting something that is important. Um, obviously a checklist shouldn't be followed blindly. As you go through it, you're likely to see some questions that aren't appropriate for this particular case. Fair enough. Then just cross through it or uh, move on to the next one. You are also likely to, to think, wow, there's some questions here that I need to add. Awesome. You're going to add those questions to it. So you, you ought not feel like it's a straitjacket limiting your ability to improvise. But you do want to return to the um, to the, the checklist. Yes, you'll, you'll move on to other topics, but then return to that spot that you were at initially so you can make sure that you're not missing anything. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and put this on the, um, in, into the uh, uh, slides, into the slideshow mode. So let's um, move on. So here are some examples of questions. I'm not going to go through each one of these slides. At your leisure, you may want to look at this. This is just one example of, of a checklist that you might have. Um, you know, obviously you're going to want to get the full name of the uh, client as well as any former names. Perhaps um, uh, she has a maiden name or perhaps uh, she was previously married to somebody and she no longer goes by that name. Or perhaps he was adopted at a, as a teenager and he had had a different surname as a child. Lots of different circumstances can affect names. You'd also want to get nicknames. Maybe you're going to do a database search. And this is somebody whose given name is Robert, but he prefers to go by Bob. Or maybe his name is Andrew Michael, but he prefers to go by Michael. Well, some of the documents associated with him may be under Andrew or A.M., Smith or whatever his last name is. So you want to have all that information. And then you want to have a lot of biographical information. What's his home address, his business address, telephone numbers, email addresses, all of that kind of stuff. How to find him in a, in a, when a, an urgent situation comes up. I mean, if you have the addresses, emails, and cell, you're probably in good shape. But you may also want to have the, the telephone number or name of a spouse. And you're going to want that for other purposes. You'll want to find out what kind of social media he has. It's very likely that he's posted something, or not likely, but it's possible he's posted something on one or more of the social media uh, places about uh, what's going on in his life. Maybe about the actual incident, but even if, even if he hasn't talked about the incident, he may talk about maybe the symptoms that he's having or, or the, the fallout from that situation. Uh, some of those postings may seem to contradict some of the testimony he provides. We all know in Facebook, some people like to be a little overly dramatic, or maybe a person might want to be a, a little stoic about a situation and minimize maybe the pain or, or fears or unhappiness they have as a result of something. So these can be sources of... Um, of uh, conflicting information in some cases, and uh, since they are uh, you know, open kind of to the public generally, uh, there's something that you'll need to address and deal with throughout the, the, the uh, progress of the lawsuit. It's something that's a good idea to talk with the attorney about, what the attorney wants to have happen with social media pages. It's very likely that, or I say very likely, it's possible that the attorney will, will recommend that the Clients stop making posts, not delete past posts, but not stop making any additional posts. On the other hand, the attorney may think that it's okay as long as the client avoids topics that are somehow related to that. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind. How the client likes to communicate can also be a good piece of information to have. If the client doesn't use email and you're sending him emails all the time, but he's not seeing them, that's not a very effective uh, tool to use. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind. Obviously, you'll want to have family information about him, um, date of birth, education, employers, current ones, past ones. Obviously, insurance information can be important. If it's, an, if it's a car accident case, you'll need to have auto insurance, uh, but it may also be relevant to get health insurance information and other types of information as well. Arrests and convictions can be important, especially um, if there's some hint of illegality in whatever happened, but sometimes that testimony can be allowed in for other reasons too, perhaps um, having something to do with um, the credibility of the witness or something along those lines.
then you'd want to get a good financial picture about the uh, client's circumstances, um, what their assets and liabilities are, the debts that they have, have they filed for bankruptcy, things along those lines. You'll want to get any statements that he's provided to anyone. It may be a police officer. It may be the um, insurance company. Um, it could be some other resource that he has that, that might have some information about it. It's important to have that so we know what's out there because certainly the other side will eventually know about it too. So you want to know why is the client seeking legal advice? It's usually fairly obvious. If there is a discrete event, such as a car accident, you'll want to know the name of the event and the chronology. We're getting pretty detailed here, and you want to get things in chronological order. And it's good to start from the beginning and, and get all the facts in the order they happen. Now I will tell you, even though it's good to start that way, realistically, people don't usually go A to B to C to D to E. They'll go A to B to C to Q to P, to E. They're going to jump around because something about fact C reminds them about fact Q and something about fact Q reminds them of fact M and so forth. Um, it's kind of your decision about whether to let the witness be a little bit all over the map because uh, sometimes seeing how their brain works and the connections they make can help you understand them better and understand the circumstances better. On the other hand, if they're jumping around from place to place, it may be difficult for you to make sure you're getting all the facts. And so depending upon how much time you have um, and, and the circumstances surrounding it and the personality of the witness, you may want to exercise more or less control under those circumstances. You want to have a full picture of the liability and who might have liability in the situation. And it's good to, to think this through. For example, imagine it's a car accident case. Well, who is the universe of people that could be responsible? Well, if let's say your client was driving, you're Mary, or your client is Mary, and Mary was driving, so she could be liable because she made a bad decision while she was driving. She was driving a car owned by Bob, no, we'll say by Larry. Well, maybe Larry is responsible because he didn't maintain his car well. The car is a Ford. Well, maybe Ford is responsible because they manufactured a poor car. Um, it has a, the, a possible issue is the brakes. Well, maybe a subcontractor for Ford will say, you are brakes, made the brake pads, and that's what caused the problem. Well, maybe you want to sue, you are brake pads. Uh, maybe uh, Larry took the car into a We Fix Brakes Incorporated uh, place, and maybe they did a poor job fixing the brakes. So that might be another, per another entity that you want to sue. All of those are just, you know, a little bit of the piece. Then you want to think about maybe the accidents between Mary and Bob. Well, you want to do that same analysis for Bob. Bob was driving. Who owned the car? What model car was it? What kind of repairs had been done? And again, it's very possible Mary won't know about Bob's car, but you can at least ask to find out the facts. Maybe the city or the county or the state or even the federal government's responsible if there was a design problem with the road. Um, maybe there was a third car that didn't even get hit in the accident that somehow contributed to the accident. Or perhaps it was a, a pedestrian who somehow contributed to the accident. So there's lots of different things to consider. And you may not even know all the ideas you want to explore until you hear Mary's story. And Mary starts talking about you as, oh, wait a second, that person may have some culpability in, in the circumstances. And so you're always kind of thinking that through. You're not just listening to the story, you're, trying, you're, you're thinking about each person men, wit, uh, mentioned and saying, huh, how can that person impact um, the legal claims that we might have? Then you'll want to get an idea about exactly what damage the client exp experienced. The medical bills, the pain and suffering he or she has felt, um, the physical impairment that the person might have. Did they lose fingers, an arm, a leg? Are they in a wheelchair? Do they have loss of eyesight? Are there scars? And what are the impact of those scars upon that person? Uh, getting a, a description, maybe it's no big deal to the person. Maybe it's a a source of, of great stress and anxiety, all kinds of different reactions, in part depending upon the, the type of disfigurement. Loss of earnings can be a big issue, and then there could be other things, and not just personal injuries, but also injuries to the car, 
or you know whatever the nature of the uh, the particular situation is then you want to also get an overall understanding about how that injury has affected the clients a life you know has this person experienced depression or uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of experiencing this situation and has this negatively impacted relationships that person has had uh, maybe with the spouse or children maybe with an employer all kinds of different impacts that might exist the client may not have even connected those events at this time so you may you may be asking questions that cause the client to look at situations in, in new new ways you want to get as many um, exhibits uh, any documentation that can exist obviously you want to get the medical bills um, for example if, if the person has experienced medical bills um, any um, evidence of property damage estimates for repairs if repairs have been done what those bills look like get as much of that documentation as possible if the client doesn't have it it may be necessary for you to subpoena some of those records um, We'll go on and talk about parties. We've already kind of talked about this. You'll want to get for, for the for the likely defendants, you'll want to get whatever contact information exists. Obviously, if Mary and Bob are strangers that have a car accident together, Mary's not likely to know Bob's home, you know, address. But she may know his name or she may have enough information that it can help you lead to who that person might be. Um, and and thinking through uh, corporations such as the insurance company that Bob used or, or things along those lines so that you so as, as much information you get from Mary recognizing you're probably not going to get to the end zone there but you're going to at least make some progress down the field by getting the information Mary has you'll also want to think through the the types of issues that Bob is going to raise the defendant is going to raise again we're looking at this from the perspective of the plaintiff but you can flip it around and look at it from the perspective of the defendant as well they may be thinking well we care about Mary's case we're not representing Bob well that's true but the jury is going to hear Bob's story so we want to be prepared for it so we can have a response and even if we don't have a very good response let's say Bob has an awesome argument well that's at least going to inform us in terms of what our settlement posture ought to be so we ought to to be aware of the possible defenses Bob can advance uh, the, their relative strength the relative weakness and how we might be able to combat those it's also possible that Bob may have a counterclaim let's talk for a second about the term counterclaim and you can see it's in red so it's in vocabulary terms a counterclaim is a cause of action asserted by the defendant against the plaintiff as part of the same lawsuit as the plaintiff's cause of action so in other words we start the lawsuit with the plaintiff filing a claim against the defendant and the defendant is likely to answer that complaint when he answers he can choose to actually file a counterclaim so now he is in some sense the defendant is both the defendant and a plaintiff and now the plaintiff is still a plaintiff but is also a defendant in that counterclaim and so that's a uh, something to consider is it likely going back to our car accident scenario if Mary's if Mary feels that Bob caused the accident that injured her car and injured her it's quite likely that Bob's car was injured and maybe Bob was injured as well and Bob may see the facts very differently and may think that it's Mary's fault so a, a a counterclaim is entirely possible under those circumstances statute of limitations okay let's first of all consider what that word means it means what you think it does it's certainly what we've we we would would hear mentioned in in on the television or whatever it's a statute so obviously the first part is pretty obvious <laughs> it's a statute that limits the time period that a plaintiff can can have in order to file a lawsuit the type of claim that the plaintiff is raising is going to establish the length of time so if it's a, a negligence claim there will be a certain number of years if it's a breach of contract claim there's going to be a certain number of years if it's a statutory claim it's going to be a certain number of years so uh, one of the things you're concerned about obviously is are we outside of the statutory period if we are what arguments might we have that will allow us to um, extend the statutory period if we're not outside the statutory period but the statutory period is getting close then we're going to have to act quickly that might be one reason why we make our initial pre-suit investigation shorter than usual we still have our rule 11 obligations but we can um, maybe proceed a little bit faster if we're up against a pretty close a statutory period 
Another thing to consider is, is our client under the age of 18? In Texas, uh, plaintiffs um, who are under 18 cannot sue on their own behalf. They can be sued, but they can't sue directly. But there are ways around that. You can um, have a guardian ad litem appointed to handle that situation. There's also other issues with other potential plaintiffs and defendants that you have to kind of work through when and if they arise. Witnesses. Um, likely that there's going to be witnesses beyond the plaintiff and the defendant. Maybe the people who are in the adjacent cars, maybe the police officer who investigated the situation, maybe the EMT who uh, assisted uh, one or both of the victims during the, the accident. Um, uh, people who were standing near the intersection who might have observed what happened. The, you want to get as much information from your client about what who these people are, what they may have seen, and how they might be reachable. You know, again, of course, want to get all the documents that the plaintiff has about the situation. Um, medical records, receipts from the police department, citations, things along those lines, any statements or notes that the, that the client might have. Um, if it's a breach of contract case, case obviously you're going to want to have the contract. If there's medical uh, bills associated with it, you want to have all that documentation as well. And it's not just documents, it could be um, physical items uh, that, that could be important. For example, x-rays um, or uh, computer records that you might have that are relevant to the particular case. Um, uh, it's very likely if this is a document intensive type of case that you'll need to have more than one meeting with the client to review all the documentation, but it's kind of good to have an overview about what you have. And then if the client has, has not thought to bring a particular resource, you can say, okay, we, we don't have this, we need this, why don't you bring this next time we meet together. Most cases you're going to want some kind of authorization form so that you can start gathering the documents without constantly asking the, the client to gather them. Uh, a HIPAA compliant medical authorization form is you can send to the clients, doctors and hospitals and physical therapists and people like that to get the documentation. HIPAA is a federal law that has to do with the privacy of medical records. and. Uh, what you're basically saying is, is that um, the client has agreed to waive his privacy interests in accordance with the HIPAA rules and now wants to get these records and they should be surrendered to the law firm that's representing the client. Also, um, you want very likely to get records from the employer, so you want to have some authorization form there so you can get perhaps wage relevant records. Um, uh, maybe the days that the person was absent uh, because of medical treatment or something along those lines. Okay, we talked about physical evidence already, such as x-rays, but pictures can also be very useful. Um, you may even want to go out or talk about where the intersection was and maybe even go with the client to see, especially if the accident was recent, to see kind of, well, is this the way it looked at the time that the accident happened? Are those skid marks related to your accident? Um, was the were, were those barrels there or or was the, the the structure the same that it is now and if it's different how is it different from from how it was at that time obviously you want to have tape recordings video recordings photographs all of that kind of stuff that the client might have and it's a good idea to kind of, especially in this era of smartphones to remind the client about all the sources that he may have this data. Um, he may, his wife or, or husband or maybe someone else present, a friend might have this data. And so, you know, kind of brainstorm with him or her how that data might exist and where it can be found. And of course, it might be on, on the cloud somewhere. Very often, clients uh, have to shop around to find an attorney. This is especially true when you're the plaintiff because Keep in mind, most plaintiff's attorneys take on cases on a contingency fee basis. And so when the client comes to see the attorney, the attorney may say, well, well we don't think your claim is strong enough or is going to have enough damages to justify us entering into a representation agreement with you. And so then the client is going to have to shop around to get another law firm 
On the other hand, maybe the client decides this law firm isn't for me. So it's a good idea to find out the connection that, that your client has had with other law firms. Do they shop around and who do they shop around with? Um, and you want to ask, why are you not using that law firm? And that might give you some very valuable information about what's going on in the particular situation. You'll also want to find about other lawsuits. What if you find out that your client seems to be very sue happy, you know, suing everybody over every little thing? That's not the best fact, but better that you know it now than you know it later on. So you can develop a strategy for that. You'll also want to know about lawsuits where your client has been the defendant. Um, and so you can figure out kind of what the circumstances there are. You may think it's too early to think in terms of settlement, and certainly sometimes this isn't a, a productive way to begin, but it is certainly possible that a case will settle even before the lawsuit is filed. Sometimes clients are reluctant to settle at first and become more, more interested in it as time progresses. Other times they are very interested in it from the very beginning. Many times they may be affected by, uh, their willing to sell may be affected by their current financial situation. Even if they have a very strong case, it may be many, many months, even years before they actually see any money. And that may not be something that is realistic for them. They may prefer to have $10,000 today than $100,000 in three years, um, you know, because of their individual circumstances. Maybe they're about to be foreclosed on, for example, or they're about to lose custody of their child or something along those lines where money is really important now. And so they might have a, a willingness to discount the value of their lawsuit so they can get the cash right now. So talking about what their uh, position is on settlement, uh, what their numbers are, do they want to settle now, do they want to wait? Obviously, they you, know, you need to have both sides interested in settlement before it can happen. These discussions do need to be handled with a certain amount of care because many times clients have unrealistic expectations about the value of their claims or if they're the defendant, the value of the plaintiff's claims. Um, we've all seen cases in which, on um, the least the news has presented, a, a rather silly lawsuit, or at least it appears to be a silly lawsuit, and then the plaintiff gets a lot of money. Well, plaintiffs sometimes think that's what's going to happen with them. And possibly it will, but more likely it won't. And so um, if you allow the, the, the client to talk about unrealistic expectations and uh, don't challenge him about that, then he might get the idea, ah, yes, the law firm agrees with me that these are realistic goals. On the other hand, you are not empowered to give legal advice. And so um, if you start saying, well, that's not a realistic expectation for this case, um, then you may be crossing the line and getting into legal advice. So it can be helpful to say uh, the, the, the attorney has advised me that typically we see cases of this type settling in this range, if that is in fact what the attorney has told you. Um, so, so there can be some strategies to start setting up reasonable expectations early on. If you aren't empowered to do that at this time, what you may want to do then is say, um, that'll be great if that's what happens. Just know that sometimes, um, you know, our expectations in these areas aren't, aren't completely satisfied, and so it's a good idea to be open to revising those expectations, depending upon how the facts develop. Obviously, you want to know what the client is attempting to accomplish. In most cases, what the client wants is money, obviously. But sometimes they have other goals. Maybe they want to be heard. Maybe they want an apology. Maybe they want something back. Maybe they want revenge. You know, there are all kinds of things. So it's good to talk that through. It can also help you in terms of developing that settlement plan for the case. Um, just talking to you the paralegal can sometimes help the client satisfy some of those goals. Sometimes the client just wants to be heard. Now, obviously, um, you know, that's not you're, not, you're not there to be a therapist, you're not there to be um, the best friend of the client, but uh, when the client wants something other than money, uh, you know, wants his day in court or something like that, sometimes uh, being able to talk candidly and openly about his difficult experience with the attorney or with the paralegal can help solve some of those wounds and then help him move to a more 
a reasonable position in terms of settlement. So, you, so just these conversations can in some sense help you move to a settlement posture that's going to in the long run meet the client's needs as well as meet your hopefully your, your firm's goals in the representation. So that's an example of a checklist, but let's go through a little bit more about um, so we've talked about working in the checklist, but let's talk a little bit more about how we're actually going to uh, conduct the, that initial client interview. A lot of this is just common sense. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. You know, once the client arrives, you know, you obviously want to treat the client as somebody who um, is important to you, who deserves respect and courtesy, um, who is um, a guest in this law firm. And so you don't want to make them wait. You want to greet them personally. There's a certain level of formality here, so you're going to want to shake hands and introduce. Oftentimes it's a good strategy to refer to them initially, at least, as Mr. Smith or Miss Smith or something like that. Um, and you, you may want to at some point say, um, would, it be, would it be all right with you if I called you Bob or Mary or whatever their names might be? Sometimes there's a generational aspect or a cultural aspect, and so you want to be especially sensitive in those circumstances. It's almost never a mistake to give more formality or more deference to a, a client um, than you end up in the long run needing to do. Uh, so if you are not sure whether to call the person Bob or Mary or Mrs. Smith or Mr. Smith, err on the more formal side. Um, it's easier to go from more formal to less formal depending upon the circumstances. And you're unlikely to offend somebody by calling them Mr. Smith or Ms. Smith, um, whereas you might offend somebody by calling them by their first name. It's a good idea to find a comfortable place, make sure you have comfortable chairs that his or her chair is as comfortable as yours. Um, sometimes it's nice to be on the same side of the table so that there's some, there's less of a boundary. If you're going to take notes, though, if, and you're on the same side, keep in mind that the client's going to be able to read whatever you write. Even if he's across the table from you, he's still very possibly going to be able to read what you, you write. And he may even ask to read what you wrote. So you would should never write anything uh, during the actual interview that you would be embarrassed or you feel like it would damage the relationship for the client to see. Obviously, this is a, a professional interview. This isn't a social interview. So we want to get on task pretty quickly. But on the other hand, this is going to be a strange new world for most clients. And so to immediately say, hi, you've never met me before, but I'm Bob Smith, the paralegal, and let's get down to what happened on this particular day. That's a little bit much. You kind of want to warm up the, the person a little bit. Would you like a, a coffee? Would you like a soda? Um, uh, let me show you where the ladies' or men's room is if you need to take a break. Um, and then engage in a bit of small talk. Boy, it's been hot here lately, hasn't it? Or, gosh, I understand we might have some snow this weekend. Or, boy, can you believe what happened in the big game on Sunday? I, I, I was not expecting that. Or whatever the thing might be. Obviously, you want to avoid controversial topics. You don't want to discuss religion or politics or things like that because the last thing you want in that initial interview is for there to be a tension where the, the client has X view and you have, uh, y view, and so now the client is uncomfortable or you're uncomfortable. But doing a little bit of small talk can get people a little settled and a little bit ready to begin. And of course, you want to extend uh, as much courtesy as you can. You're going to want to turn your cell phone off, and you're going to want to uh, either not answer phones or ideally forward your phone either to voicemail or to another person's office so that you're not interrupted. It's a good idea to get to know the client to some extent. Now, is it really relevant? It's a car accident case. Is it really relevant to know that your client loves to play backgammon? Probably not. But again, it can make the client feel comfortable. And as you get to know the client and he gets to know you, it's very likely he's going to become more forthcoming. So spending five minutes getting to know him a bit may make the whole interview say an hour may take an hour less time because he's more forthcoming. So it can be a good investment. You know, on the other hand, you don't want to spend an hour talking about um, arcane backgammon strategies instead of talking about the lawsuit. 
it's good to tell the client at the beginning why you're meeting, what your goals are. Even showing the client your checklist can be helpful. It can be reassuring. Oh, we have a plan. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and the client can, it can help the client stay focused. So if the client goes off on a tangent, you can say, okay, that's great. Um, let's see, we're on number four now. What do you think about this? And then the client knows exactly what you're doing and can help you stay on task as well. Um, to record or not record. In other words, should you um, have an audio or video recording of the interview? Uh, this is a controversial topic and uh, differing attorneys have differing views on it. I think it would be relatively unusual for an attorney to say, under no circumstances would we ever record or Take the opposite view. Under all circumstances, no matter what, we would always record. Um, whatever the direction is that you get from the attorney is what you ought to follow, but you ought to have an understanding about um, what the attorney's perspective is on this particular case. There's a lot of reasons, that, and some of them legal, some of them more practical, about why it may be more appropriate to record in certain cases than others. Some of it has to do with whether the information will be discoverable. Some of it has to do with costs. Uh, some of it has to do perhaps with the personality of the client. When something is being taped, many times people will get more nervous and sometimes clam up. They're already intimidated. They're already uncomfortable. This is an alien situation and now they're being recorded. That adds yet another layer to the situation. So, um, that can you know be another reason why it's not useful if you do record it of course it can make it easier to take notes because you don't really don't really have to take nearly as many notes and so it allows you to spend more time establishing eye contact you can actually move to the questions quicker because you're not having to write anything down but of course you have to decide how am I going to take that transcript and reduce it to a document I mean there are software that can do that but invariably you're going to find that people don't speak in complete sentences and um, the transcript it may not be clear who's saying what because in the real real world people interrupt each other constantly and so the transcript might be relatively difficult to interpret if it's just the typed words that were spoken so for those reasons um, it's a complicated issue and that's why you want to talk with the attorney whether you record or not of course you're going to want to have the client know that you're recording if that's what you choose to do and if the client objects it would be a very unusual circumstance that you would push it any farther than that um, if you are not going to record the interview you're obviously going to need to take at least some notes by hand um, if you are recording it you will probably also still want to take a few notes by hand um, it's a good idea though, perhaps at the very beginning, especially when you're doing the small talk, not to take so many notes because you want to establish that rapport. You'll need the eye contact and the back and forth conversation without those pauses while you're writing. Um, so you want to uh, probably kind of back off on that just initially. Obviously you want to maintain eye contact, have a, an open body language, and again, try to be relatively physically close to the client, but not invading their personal space, of course. So let's talk about how you might actually uh, structure the questions that you'd be asking. You're going to want to start and in fact spend the majority of your time in the interview asking what we call open-ended questions. An open-ended question is exactly what you think it is. It's a question that doesn't, that causes the, um, the answerer to answer in a paragraph form. It's not a yes-no question. It's not a, you know, a number question. Is it four? Is it seven? That type of thing. It requires the uh, answerer to explain or to tell a story about it. Um, that's definitely the first category of questions you're going to want to ask. Um, it's a conversational style of asking questions. Um, and it's helpful because you get to really kind of get inside the client's mind and see what the client thinks is important, see how the client views that particular circumstance. You can see here on this slide we have an example. What happened that day? Now the client might choose, let's say it's a car accident case, the client might choose to talk about right when he was entering the intersection, right before the accident. That might be where he wants to start. No reason not to start there.
On the other hand, he might say, well, I got up, you know, let's say the accident was at 2.15 p.m. He might start talking about the fact that he got up at 6.27 a.m. that morning and brushed his teeth and took a shower and had bacon and eggs for breakfast. Um, and so it kind of lets you kind of see where the client's head is and how the client uh, views the issue and, and how he approaches questions generally. You will eventually need to go to closed-ended questions, but you won't want to start there because closed-ended questions don't allow that flow, that rapport to develop because it ends up having kind of a staccato effect. What date did that happen? Tuesday. Uh, were you uh, wearing shoes? Yes. Yeah, it doesn't lead to a conversation. It's kind of a... a, a an awkward back and forth. Um, but eventually you will need to use closed-ended questions because the client will have omitted certain things. Sometimes the client has omitted it because uh, he just has so much information to give, you can't think of everything. Sometimes he omits it because he doesn't understand it's important. Sometimes he omits it because he doesn't want to talk about that. Maybe it's a bad fact for him. Maybe it's something he doesn't want to share with you. And so this is another reason why you want to wait on these closed-ended questions because sometimes asking some of these difficult questions can undermine some of that rapport. Okay, it's, it's going to happen. You're going to have to get to that moment. Most cases have good facts and bad facts, and you're going to have to talk about the bad facts. And many times, the way the bad facts come out are through these closed-ended questions. And it's invariable, in, inevitable that it's going to affect that rapport. So better to save some of those things towards the end of the interview and you get all the benefits of the good rapport um, initially. So a closed-ended question is a question that calls for a yes or no answer. Did the accident occur on this date? I mean, either it did or it didn't, right? Uh, were you wearing your seatbelt or not? Um, was the radio on? Um, uh, you know, all those things. When you entered the intersection, was the light green, yellow, or red? Those would be examples of closed-ended questions. Another type of question um, is a leading question. And again, this is another one that you're not going to start with. This is going to be one near the end. Um, sometimes even with the closed-ended questions, sometimes the, the client may hem and haw and seem to not want to answer. For example, going back to the seatbelt question, um, were you wearing your seatbelt? Well, um, you know, uh, it was just such a, a long time ago, and, um, you know, I can remember the light was still green when I entered the intersection, and, um, you know, it really wasn't my fault. I mean, that guy was crazy the way he entered it. Well, you know, in this situation, the client is deciding not to answer your question. Um, he may not remember. He um, may not want to share the information. So one way to handle it is to ask a leading question. After you've given him an attempt, you can say, you weren't wearing your seatbelt, were you? That's kind of giving him the permission to say, no, I wasn't. I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. Um, you need to know the facts, even the bad facts, maybe even especially the bad facts. Um, so um, it can be a way to kind of get down to the bottom level. You may think that things like that are going to destroy the rapport, but in many respects it's going to free it up because you've given the client permission to tell you a bad fact. There's going to be other bad facts. And now that he has permission, he's going to feel like, oh, she didn't think I was a horrible person when I told her I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. So now I feel like it's okay for me to say I had a glass of wine with lunch. Uh, right before I got behind the seat. I wasn't drunk, but um, I was just worried about saying that because it makes it sound like maybe I was drunk. And so the more you can make it okay, make it a safe zone to say the good and the bad facts, the better position your case will be in. So what is a leading question? What's well, a question that contains or suggests the desired answer and simply ask the person to assent to it. Now, in my example, you weren't wearing the seatbelt or not. I mean, that's not really the desired answer. I mean, you, you want him to have been wearing the seatbelt, right? I mean, that's the fact that you would prefer. But what you're trying to do here is give him permission. You've already pretty much decided he wasn't wearing a seatbelt, or he would have just said, no, uh, yeah, I was wearing my seatbelt. So, um, 
so in that sense the, the desired answer is a little bit of a misleading part of it but or the answer that you're expecting to be true might be the better way of phrasing that particular definition let's go to the next slide okay so again you'll be using your checklist as your guide and again it's not anything that you need to hide, hide from the client I mean, you'll be filling in the details. You'll be having a chronology of, of what's happening. So you'll probably have a document. And, you know, again, as I say, the, the, the client may be skipping around, so you'll want to have holes in your chronology so that you can go back and add additional things. You won't want to completely zone out and just look at your, um, your notes. You'll want to also maintain that, that eye contact, that rapport with the person. Um, you don't want to be locked to the questionnaire. Again, if, if the client wants to jump around, as long as you get back to where you need to be, it's sometimes a good thing to allow the client some freedom to uh, go to the topic that he wants to. Uh, let him feel that he has some control in the situation. Um, that's good in terms of client relations, and he may have something he needs to tell you that he needs to tell you in the way that he needs to tell you. And shutting him down and putting him back to where um, you want to be may mean you don't get that piece of, of the puzzle that you needed. Okay, eventually you're going you're to have to ask the tough questions. And maybe that there's a hole in the story, a, a part that he hasn't told you about, or there's something about the story that doesn't make sense. For example, the client said he went to the bar and was there for four hours and all he had was a Coke. I mean, that could happen, but kind of common sense tells you maybe it didn't. And if that's what he said, you might want to ask a follow-up question and say, okay, Mr. Smith, now come on, let's get real. How many beers did you have? Come on, it's all right, just tell me giving him permission to give you that information. And he's like, well, okay, I did have the Coke, but you know what, I, I think I did have a couple beers. A couple of beers, okay. Couple meaning four or a couple meaning five? Oh, well, uh, four, four, but, but I didn't finish the last one. Okay, okay, now, now we have the information. So sometimes when you're having these tough questions, the client can give you pushback. Well, uh, you know, you work for me. Why are you asking me these questions? I don't want to answer that. I don't have to answer that. Um, and, and one of the strategies to do that is to think of, is to tell the client, listen, I, you know, I hate to get in your business. I know this is your private stuff. And the last thing I want to do is, is ask your private stuff. But you know what? The other side's going to ask you these questions and you're going to have to answer them. So what I want to do is put us in that best position. And you can even use the term devil's advocate. I want to pretend like, uh, you know, for us to, to figure out what they can do with these facts and how we can counterbalance them, counteract them. And so that can be part of our strategy. So if you can kind of see see the you and the client as a team against um, the other side and coming up with a strategy to defuse the other side's potential weapons, that can be a good way to get, get at some of this information that isn't so happy. So here's an example. Were you using your cell phone at the time of the accident? Okay, that is a, a yes, no question. It's a closed ended question. Or had you been drinking before the accident? Another yes, no, um, uh, closed ended question. When you go through your questions, um, you want to also and this is something you're going to save more for the end, is to ask anything else, anything else. Or one thing I like to say is, what haven't I been smart enough to ask you yet that you need to share with me? What else is on your mind? And keep on asking anything else. For example, in this example, the paralegal says, what were you doing at the moment the collision occurred? And the client says, I was listening to the radio. And the, the paralegal says, okay, that must have been all that was happening. So he doesn't ask a follow-up question. But let's see what he misses out on because he didn't ask the follow-up question. Well, actually, if he had said anything else, he would have learned, oh, he was thinking about how hungry he was. Okay, that's probably not a terrible admission to make. Anything else? I was texting on my cell phone. Oh, my gosh, pretty big, pretty important. Uh, a bigger deal, really, than, than listening to the radio. The client was reluctant to say that. I mean, he probably knew very well that's what you needed to know. But he was kind of testing the waters by listening to the radio. You need to, to, to outlast him. You need to keep on going. You need to go until you hear anything else. You might even want to say after he says no, to say, are you sure? And you might even want to say, did you have your cell phone out? Were you texting? Um, were you on the phone, cell phone? 
or you're talking with somebody else in the car to come up with some more things along those lines that, that might get at that information. So obviously at the end of the interview, you're going to want to uh, shake the hand of your client, thank him for his time, uh, perhaps schedule a follow-up meeting if you have uh, more documents to discuss or more time you need to spend. Escort him out to the hallway, obviously if he needs to go to the a ladies' room or men's room to show him where that is and uh, help him get out of the office if he needs his parking validator or something like that, assist with that. Um, and uh, thank him for his time, of course, or her time for that. After he's left or she's left, then you're going to want to prepare your summary based upon your notes. And you're probably going to want to supplement your notes. There are going to be certain things that you don't put in your notes while he's there, things like, I don't believe my client when my client said this. You're not going to write that where the client can see it. So there will be certain points that you want to add. You might even have some little uh, cues that you put in your notes that will kind of be shorthand for you. For example, you might put a question mark, meaning I don't, I'm not sure I believe him here, or an exclamation mark, meaning we need to do more research about this or whatever, some things that are meaningful to you but may not be obvious to the client what's going on. So as you prepare your summary, you're going to want to organize it in a way that's going to make it accessible both to you and other people who need to see it especially the attorney. So if it's the events, you may want to organize it chronologically. Um, or you may want to follow the list in the checklist and so actually have it in that same order. There may actually be kind of a, a methodology that is used in your law firm to capture that data. Um, you also want to identify things that you haven't gotten yet that you need and you can you know, even possibly go back and fill in that information when you actually get that uh, closure on those particular issues. Um, very likely the client will have brought some documents for you. Um, in fact, at some point in the interview, you may have actually photocopied the documents and returned copies to the client and you kept the originals. And you want to make sure you're putting them in a safe place. Um, you're probably going to want to scan them into the system, some kind of computer system as well, some document management software perhaps, um, so that uh, you have more than one a cop copy of them, and that way you can have them safe and sound. You're obviously not going to want to write on the documents because you don't want to alter them in any way. If you're going to take any notes on the document itself, you're going to want to make sure it's a copy of the document. And when you make those alterations, you're going to want to make it obvious that those are not from the original documentation document, but things that you have added. You may recall our initial uh, litigation chart from before. I'm just going to flip back to when we were actually working with that so you can see what it looked like in the initial version. It's going to take me a little while to do that here. Let me sc scroll back. Ah, here we go. So remember we set up the elements. We had the duty of care, the breach of the duty of care, the two types of causation, cause and fact and foreseeability. Then we had the injuries. And in fact, we broke up the injuries into more detail. Then we had a category for the evidence. At this point, we hadn't interviewed anyone, so we didn't have any evidence to list. Then we were going to say the source and then how we anticipated getting that in at trial. And so, of course, after our interview with the client, we're going to have lots of these boxes full. And so let's go to how that slide might look. And here we go. So remember we had that duty, breach, and a cause in fact, the first three boxes. Well, now we have facts to fill in. And first of all, you can see that since the only thing we've done so far is the client, well, it makes sense the only boxes we have say client on them. And you can see that we're going to have multiple facts under some of these categories. And for each one of the facts, we're going to list our source. In this case, they're all from the client, but you know, maybe from the police officer, or from a witness, or from opposing counsel, or something along, or opposing party, or something like that. So let's look at duty. Defendant was driving a car on eastbound a Spring Creek Parkway, a public roadway. That's from the client. We don't know what the defendant's going to say, but this is the, our source of information. Breach. Client, of course that's a plaintiff because we're representing the plaintiff, was driving on northbound Avenue K through Spring Creek intersection. Client's light was green, defendant's light was red, defendant ran red light and hit client's car in middle of intersection. 
defendant admitted fault at scene of accident. So those are client's claims. That's what our client is saying. Doesn't mean that's what the defendant's going to say, but we have at least our client's version. There were no weather-related conditions contributing to the accident. The weather was warm. The street was dry. At the scene, defendant mentioned nothing about brake or other mechanical malfunction of his car. Okay, so those again, another source of information. So we've made some good progress, but again, through the deposition process, through the discovery process, we, we, we hope to add more sources, maybe what the police officer said, maybe what the defendant said at his deposition, get some more facts, but this is a good starting point for us. So after we've um, put our data into our litigation chart, uh, we're also going to want to think about what are we going to do during follow-up interviews. Um, again, we may have chosen to break up that initial interview into smaller pieces, so we are going to have, need to have more follow-up interviews to complete our story. But um, once we're done with completing our story, um, as we gather more information, even in the pre-suit stage, you know, maybe we interview or get the police report, for example, we may see some inconsistencies or some new issues. Maybe the police officer, for example, um, uh, raised a question about the skid marks or uh, thought he smelled alcohol on our client's uh, breath or something like that, something in the police report. Things that we didn't know necessarily to ask the client about during our first meeting, now we need to follow up. Um, and again, if we haven't already had um, the, the uh, medical authorization forms or the uh, employer authorization forms filled out, we'll need to do that during the subsequent meeting. Even after the lawsuit is filed, we're going to have to maintain regular contact with the client, for one thing, to update him or her about the progress of litigation. Many times that falls to the paralegal. Sometimes the attorney prefers to do that. And again, as we find out more facts through the formal discovery process, we'll want to go to the client and say, hey, this is what we're learning from the defendant. What do you think about this? What's your response to this? We'll also need to get formalized answers from the client to discovery requests, things like interrogatories. Uh, we may need to get the client's signature and uh, sworn statement on certain things for exhibits to uh, motions and, and uh, briefs and things along those lines. Um, and then, of course, we'll need to prepare the, the client for depositions and for uh, when he or she is going to be a trial witness and maybe when he or she is going to attend depositions. So there's lots of additional opportunities we'll be meeting with the client to gather information, to share information, to prepare. We are now finished with part one, the first set of um, uh, PowerPoint slides for chapter two. If you have any questions about this first half of the chapter, please feel free to ask me. I look forward to discussing them in more detail with you. Thank you, as always, for your attention. I'm going to uh, now close this meeting and um, look forward to um, seeing you in class. Take care.